Well, it is good to be back with you. My name's Rich. I don't know if I know all of you, right? Man, it, Lori and I took off for, we've been gone for five weeks, and it was uh, spectacular. I can do that because I have an amazing staff and leadership team that continue to do that. They don't need me around. You saw that, right? Ken and Ben were absolutely, Ken and Ben, Ken and Doug, right? Amazing. And Ben was in running things behind the scenes as well. I am so blessed. Uh, we had an amazing trip. We traveled 8,433 miles, and uh, I never got bored. I never, I, it was just beautiful. We saw uh, bear and caribou and herds of bison. Uh, we loved it. Uh, never, I mean, every day was spectacular. And to think, and as I prayed, God spoke all that into being was just amazing. And uh, I was telling somebody, you know how when you drive, drive into Truckee and you come up over the hill and you look down, you see Donner Lake. And if you've ever gone down there, it's spectacular. It's a beautiful, beautiful lake. I've spent many, much time down there. In Alaska, there's a Donner Lake on every corner. It, it is, there is actually, in Alaska, there are over 3 million lakes that are five acres or bigger. So everywhere you look is water. You wonder why California doesn't have any? It's all up there. It's all up there. They should build a pipeline. There's so much water. Unbelievable. But we had the time of our lives. Thank you for praying for us. And uh, we come back to a church that we love. We come back to a staff that we love and to a ministry that we love. And we are so grateful to be back and uh, be with you here today. August 16th, 2009. Anybody know what happened on August 16th, 2009? It was the date that one of the most celebrated world records was broken. So let me show you a video and see if this doesn't bring something back. Okay, you can cut it there. Usain Bolt from Nigeria smashed the world's record for the 100-meter dash. Now, some of you who may not be sprinters like me, I mean, you can time me with a calendar. You don't need a stopwatch. You may not appreciate how far he ran. It's equivalent of a little bit longer than a football field. 100 uh, meters is a little bit further than, longer than a football field. If you put me down on the end line and said, Rich, ready, set, go, in nine point, he, he, the, his new record was 9.58 seconds. It, in 9.58 seconds, if I was running, I'd make it the 20-yard line and not the far 20, like the one that's closest to me, right? So, amazing record. Now, actually, I think he could have gone faster. If you look at that, and I looked at that, that video clip many times, it almost looks like he's slowing down at the end, like he, ah, I got this thing won. I wonder what he could have done. He was running an amazing race. So let me ask you a question. Amazing athlete, world record still hold, is being held to this day. That's the record. What part of Usain Bolt's body do you think was the most important part of the body for him to beat and run the, the race and become the world record holder? So let's, mind, heart, legs, Ears, you got to be, you got to hear it, right? The gun goes off. You, you don't hear it. You're still standing there. What's that? All of it, okay? Okay, what's that? Feet. Feet. They're kind of important, huh? All these things are important. So uh, there's, a, there's a gal by the name of Kim, Kim Nunley, and she has her master's degree from uh, Cal State Fullerton University in kinesiology. And she's got this medical and scientific background. And she wrote an article trying to figure out what part of the body is most important for a sprinter to be successful. Uh, she, even with all of her medical and scientific background, she came to the conclusion that there's no really one part. That you need all the parts working together in the lower body in particular for, to have success. But she does list five of the top that she believes are the body parts that are most important. 
And the first one she came up with actually blew my mind. I wasn't even thinking about it. She said that, that she thought that the most, if she had to choose, the most important part of the body was the gluteus maximus. <laughs> now, for those of you that do not know, don't have a degree in kinesiology, that's the muscle you're sitting on right now. It's your rear end. And she says that part, but she really said, in the, she, she said, sprinting requires coordinated efforts from all the major muscles in the lower body. And he said, I thought I was going to church. What are we talking about here? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Boy, has I mean, it's just been so fun to, to be watching online with all of you uh, as Doug and Ken have been preaching, and they've done such a good job. What, what we've been learning here as we've been moving through this book is that God is on a mission. He's calling people from every, listen, tribe, nation, tongue, language, every, all these different race to come together to be his children, to receive forgiveness. And he is uniting, as we, Doug and, and Ken have been talking about, a group of us that we've referred to as spiritual misfits, people with different backgrounds, countries, language, different uh, economic backgrounds, academic understanding and background, all these different things. He's calling us together to join him in his mission. And the mystery that still blows our mind to this day is that God desires, listen to me, all of us, spiritual misfits, to be a part of what he's doing in bringing the gospel to the world. And uh, this is really the mission of the church. We all need to function together to run the race that he has for us. Now, when you read your Bible, you'll find that that uh, the Bible refers to Christians, a group of Christians like a church gathering together, by many different names. But one of the references, the titles that he, he, he makes of it, is when believers come together, he calls it the body of Christ. The body of Christ. So why does he do this? Because the world doesn't know who Jesus is. The world doesn't. How do they know that Jesus is real? How do they know that Jesus, who he is, is that they watch us? They watch us serve each other. They watch us live as God has called us to live. And they go, that's what Jesus looks like. So who is the body? You and I are the body. As we function together using what God has given to us, the world sees Jesus. So with that as a background, let's jump into our passage this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. You can follow along on the screen if you want to do that as well. Paul writes, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, in the past, as he's been talking about uniting us and all, Paul's been using the y'all language, you plural. He says y'all. When he gets here, listen to me, he starts to talk about you and me, individuals. He starts focusing in, and verse 80 says this, therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led, host of, led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. What he's talking about is Christ getting up, standing up in glory, coming down to earth, coming down here with the purpose of saving us, dying on the cross, being raised, and then ascending back to the, to the Father where he is now. And, and that's what he's talking about. Look at verse 11 now. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, some of your translations say pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, we're going to get into this. I believe that what we just read are some of the most important verses in all the New Testament for the church. Um, if we are going to have a healthy church, 
we need to understand and apply what Paul is writing about here. Sadly, the American church, by and large, listen to me, does not concern itself with health. By and large, the American church concerns itself with growth. How do we get more people in the church? How do we get more people involved in our programs? It's always about growth. But when you look at Scripture, you find that growth is not our business. Health is our business. Now, even in the book of Acts, it says, It was the Lord who added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's the Lord's business. Our business is health. We are to function as a healthy church. So, little disclaimer here. This morning's message is really directed to those people who are followers of Jesus, who are are Christians, um, who have trusted Christ. You know that you were a sinner. You believe that Jesus is God. He died on the cross for your sins. You've given your life for Him. He is God. He rose from the dead, and it's all about Him. If that's you, that's what this morning's message for. Is, is really directed to. If that's not you, we're really glad you're here. Uh, I, I hope you can learn some things along the way, but I just want you to know that's what we're on the, I'll be talking about is really not for you. It's for us who are in the household of faith through, through faith in, in Christ. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put a big, huge, complex statement up on the board, and then we're going to kind of dissect it as we go through the text, okay? So uh, here, here's the big summary of what we're going to be looking at this morning. God gave spiritual gifts to people in the church to carry out the spiritual functions of the church under the spiritual leadership of people given to the church so that his mission may be accomplished through the church. Everybody get that? Say amen. Okay, let's go home. Oh, my goodness. That's a complex statement. I mean, you're saying, Rich, that is a long sentence. I mean, how in the world? Okay, you should have, this is the simplified version. You should have seen my initial one. I would have bored you to tears, right? So here, here's the deal. Uh, what I want us to do is I want us to kind of unpack this because this passage is so important to having healthy churches. So here we go. Our first point is this. We're going to break it apart. God gave spiritual gifts to people in the church. Now, this concept of God giving spiritual gifts to people is not unique to this passage in uh, Ephesians. Uh, Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He says this, A spiritual gift is given to each of us believers so that we can help each other. Peter talked about it as well. In 1 Peter 4.10, he said this, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So now let's go back to the passage in Ephesians 4.7. It says this, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, so we're trying to figure out, okay, spiritual gifts. Let's get our arms around it. I want you to see some words that I've underlined it and uh, on the screen here, the, f- the first one. The first one I look at is the word grace. You see that? What's that mean? What we've been given is not deserved. We're not worthy of it. There's nothing we do for it. We simply, it is given as by grace. The second word I want you to see up there is given. It is not future tense. It is past tense. You, you, this is not something that's going to happen to you one day. This is something that has happened already to you. You have been gifted. It has been given to you. And then the last word is gift. It's not something that you have to do to earn. It is a gift. It, it, it's uh, the only thing you have to do to get this gift is receive it. So let me give you a definition of spiritual gifts because we're going to be talking about, if you're a Christian, here we go. Very important you take a look at this. Let's take the next. Spiritual gifts are supernatural, and it should say enablements, not entablements. I don't know who wrote that up. That would be me. I did that. Don't blame anybody. Spiritual gifts are supernatural enablements graciously given by the Holy Spirit to followers of Jesus 
to be used in serving the body of Christ so that it may fulfill its mission of expanding the kingdom of God locally and globally. At the moment of salvation, at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. And one of the things that he did in that moment, he graciously brought to you a supernatural enablement, a gift that you are to use in expanding his kingdom. You got one of those. Now, what are these spiritual gifts? Uh, they're mentioned in different places in Scripture. Uh, you don't have to, we don't, we're not going to do it right now. If you want to do some more homework later on, uh, Romans chapter 12, you can read about some of the spiritual gifts are mentioned there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14, there's another place where there's some spiritual gifts that are mentioned there, and you can do your own research on that. In all, there's over 25 spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament, and I I want to just share with you what I'm feeling. I happen to believe that not all of the spiritual gifts are mentioned in Scripture. I think we really have just a sampling of them in these different places. Why do I believe that? I'm not going to die for it. Why do I believe it? Because they're not all in one place. If, if Paul said, this is the list, this is the list. But they're not. They're in different places. We have to go to find them. And so it makes me, lends me to believe that maybe this is just a, a simple sampling of it. Every single person given a grace gift, supernatural gift from the Lord. Now, let me get personal here for a second. So, one of my spiritual gifts is the gift of teaching. If you don't know that, maybe I need to rethink my, 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 where I'm going here in life. But that's something that God gave to me. Now, some of you may be tempted to say, Rich just has the natural ability to communicate. No, I don't. I don't have that. If you, you, if you were in my high school English class where I had to speak for three and a half minutes, you would know that's true. I was a Christian, but I was really not surrendered fully to the Lord at that time. And I was trying, in my flesh, if you will, I was trying to speak. And boy, that, it was a train wreck. I was terrified. Uh, if you would have told me that every week I would speak to hundreds of people, I would have told you, you might be smoking something or you might be crazy because I don't have that. But God, when I, as I surrendered my life to Him, God's Spirit brought to me a supernatural enablement. Now, all of us, in truth, are teachers. If you are a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus. We are all to teach because we're all to be involved in discipleship of other people. And so we need to share. But God gifts some in our mix with a supernatural enablement to open the Word of God and make it understandable and clear and, and plain. The same thing's true with the gift of, of giving. Um, we are all to be generous. We are all, as a follower of Jesus, every single person the Bible tells us, should be giving of our resources, giving of our time. We should be givers. But some in our church family have a supernatural enablement of giving. You say, Rich, how do you know who they are? I'll tell you who they are. Anytime we have a need in our church, these people line up at my door. They're the first ones to line up and they go, what do we do? How can we help? How do we get this thing going? Let's get this thing going. How do I go? You say, well, aren't they just generous people? No. This is a supernatural enablement by the Spirit of God that opens their hearts up to give generously. Let me, let me read you what John MacArthur says. He says this. Each believer's spiritual giftedness is unique. I want to just stop there for a moment, and I don't, I don't want you to miss this. There is not one person in this church fellowship who's like you. And if you are gifted and you're sitting on the sidelines, we can never run the race. Like we're supposed to. Each believer's spiritual giftedness is unique. 
as each were a spiritual snowflake or fingerprint. It is as if God dips his paintbrush into different colors or categories of gifts on his spiritual palette and paints each Christian a unique blend of colors. Every single one of us, every single one of you is essential to God fulfilling his purpose in the church. So you ask the question, okay, well, okay, I I know what spiritual gifts are now a little bit, but who has a spiritual gift? The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 7, each one of us, us being Christians, meaning nobody is excluded. Some of you like math, some of you don't like math. I get it. Bear with me. Let me put an equation up on the screen. Who has a spiritual gift? Saved. Equals. I'll I'll show you the second half in just a moment. If you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you believe that He is God. He's the only way. You've given your life to Him. You're following Jesus. Put your hand up. Hold it up for a second. Just, Just for a second. Great. Leave it up. Sweet. Leave it up. Now let me finish the second part of the equation. Okay, so all of us have our hands up. Guess what? We're gifted. Now go ahead and put them down. Saved equals gifted. Now, some of you are really messed up. I don't, I'm not good with math, and that, that equal sign is just, I can't get my arms around it. If you're saved, God has supernaturally enabled, given you a gift, a supernatural enablement to serve his body, to represent him. And if you go AWOL and you don't serve, we can't run the race like we're supposed to run it. We tend to think of people up here on the stage, oh, they're the important ones. They, they, they must be the most important. They, they're, let, me, let me tell you something. There's, there's nobody that's more important than anybody else. Matter of fact, what I've learned this morning from my message is that, if anything, all those people that come up here, Ken, Doug, me, the worship team, we might be the gluteus maximus. Just the rear end, you know. We're all in this together. We're we're all to be involved. I love what Paul Tripp says. Man, is this good. Just let this sink in for you, okay? Here we go. Imagine that Paul's just speaking to you, or God's Spirit speaking to you. He says this. Your life is much bigger than a good job, an understanding spouse, and non-delinquent kids. It's bigger than beautiful gardens, nice vacations, and fashionable clothes. In reality, you are a part of something immense, something that began before you were born and will continue after you die. God is rescuing fallen humanity, transporting them into his kingdom and progressively changing them into his likeness, and he wants you to be a part of it. And not only does he want you to be a part of it, but he has supernaturally gifted you to be a part of it. And there's nobody else like you. Nobody else can play the role that you've been gifted to play. Let's continue on. I'm just getting warmed up. God gave supernatural gifts to people in the church to carry out the spiritual functions of the church under the spiritual leadership of people given to the church. Okay, so this is what we're talking about is verse 11, um, and we're, it, he actually, you know, it, he's talking about giving pastors and teachers and all this stuff, and, and so what the church has done is we have, we'll disagree on this, is this, are these functions of the church or are these offices of the church? And we may have made it in the church uh, an either or. Are, are these offices of the church or are these functions of the church? And for a long time, I would have landed over here. These are offices of the church. But I have, as I've studied a lot on this passage, I will tell you this. I I think it's not an either or. I think it's a both and. I I believe that 
healthy churches function in a way, and we're going to talk about that, under the authority of offices. So let me see if we can't understand this a little bit better. And by the way, we're going to get a little deeper here. And just stay with me because I think this is really important for us to understand what a healthy church looks like. So I want us to first off look at the five functions of a healthy church. If a church is going to be healthy, these are five functions that a healthy church has to have. Okay, here's the first one. An apostolic function. I put the words on there, seeing and leading. What an apostolic function We'll talk about offices later. A church that's healthy has an apostolic function. It sees the big picture of what God is doing locally and globally, and it leads the church to join God in his eternal redemptive mission. Now, can I share with you the apostolic seeing and leading function of the church is the greatest lacking function of the American church. We are so, the American church is so function, uh, so focused, excuse me, on us that we have made us the end game. But if we have a healthy a, 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 a function of, as a, of an apostle, what ends up happening is we realize that we are not the end game. The end game, the big picture, is the kingdom of God. It's not about us. That every tongue and tribe and people and nation and healthy churches, if you find a healthy church, you got to have this apostolic function. What's the big picture? It's not just about us. We think it's all about us, right? It's just crazy. I mean, I, I won't go to the church because they don't sing the songs I want or, you know, they don't, you know, do this. The color of the carpet's not right or the sermon goes too long. <laughs> I was on vacation. Somebody sent me this little clip, an email, and it said, there's a fine line between a sermon going too long and a hostage situation. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But in healthy churches, when people are using their gifts, there's this function, and it is a what's the big picture? What is God doing, seeing, and leading the church to remember the big picture, the kingdom of God? The second function that is talked about in verse 11 is a prophetic function, hearing and revealing. This prophetic function listens to God's voice and then reveals his instruction. And by the way, this is the second greatest weakness of the church in America. Why? Because we don't need God. We've got our church, and we've got our strategies, and we've got our programs, and we've got our, our policies, and we've got all these things, and, and we don't need God. We have a well-oiled machine. Everything's going smoothly. But we could gather together for week after week after week after week and God never show up and we wouldn't even notice it. And a healthy church has this prophetic function. We don't do things because we did them last year. We do things because God is leading us. We listen to him and we reveal this is where God's leading us. The third function of a healthy church is evangelistic. It's looking and telling. It's looking for people who don't know Jesus, telling them about Jesus. The fourth function is pastoral, protecting and caring. And I'll tell you something, this is where the church in America has excelled. Protecting the body from harm, caring for the needs of others. And then the fifth function is teaching, feeding and training, providing spiritual nourishment. Unfortunately, see these last two? Those last two, the pastoral and the teaching, that's where the Church of America has excelled. 
And so what we have in our churches across America are biblically literate, theologically sound people in a church that is dying because we don't have the apostolic fun, uh, function in the church where we are seeing the big picture or we, the prophetic where we're hearing, we're listening intentionally to God and revealing where he wants us to go. There's only two continents in the world where Christianity is dying. You want to guess one of them? North America. The other one's Western Europe. You know why? Because there's no apostolic or prophetic. So we got all the facts, but we're dying. So you ask yourself the question, well, how do these five functions take place in a church? It, does it happen when all the pastors plan it, got a great plan, and they got it all planned out? No. It happens, listen, when the body of Christ is all using their gifts and together these functions are carried out under, these things start happening and they are carried out under the spiritual leadership that God has given to his church, which is now the offices. This is the functions. This is what's the function. Let me show you how he wants to lead his church. You know, the four offices of the church, the first one is apostles. Let's go back to the same text. Who were the apostles? The apostles were the original eyewitnesses to the historic risen Jesus Christ whose authority has been preserved to us today in the New Testament. I'm not talking about an apostolic function. I'm talking about the office of apostle. These men saw the resurrection. They wrote down in, on, in the, that we have as a Bible and they gave it to us, the apostles. The second office in the church is, was the prophets. Who were the prophets? They were spokesmen and spokeswomen who were actually vehicles of God for direct revelation. See, before the Bible was written, those with the gift of prophecy would stand up and they would speak God's word. They, God spoke through them. Now, let me tell you something. These two gifts, these two offices, were temporary. They did not last forever. Once the Bible was complete, these two offices in the church stopped. You say, Rich, how do you know that? I don't know. It sounds like a good idea. I read my Bible. Here's, here's what I read. In Ephesians chapter 2, look at it. It's on the screen. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the what? The foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Once the word of God was put together, written for us, eyewitnesses account. Boy, during those early years, it would have been so easy for Christianity to go way. But everything came back to the apostles. They were eyewitnesses. Nope, this is how it is. They wrote, they had the authority, and we have the authority today. So you say, well, Rich, do we have people with the gift of prophecy today? I mean, these offices, do they, do they still, are they still here? Let me tell you something. We do not need somebody to, to speak for God. Why? We've got the Word of God. The gift of prophecy, if you want to use that today, is speaking from God's Word. There's a difference. They didn't have the word of God. They spoke for God. The gift of prophecy today, if you want to use that, again, is speaking from the word of God, not for God. Let me give you the third office. The third office, quickly, is evangelist. Uh, these were people that God gifted to, to, to uh, preach the gospel to the lost, locally and, and globally. We would call them missionaries. We would call them uh, church planters, perhaps as well. And then the last office is pastor teachers called by God, given to the church to shepherd the flock by protecting and feeding. Now, 
A lot of information. Let's get it more practical. Let's bring it back. I told you earlier I have the gift of, of, of teaching. But God also has given me a gift of leadership, and he's also given me the gift of mercy. Um, I have a, a, a soft spot in my heart when the sheep hurt. I hurt. I can hear a story. I can walk into a, a hospital room when somebody's just been diagnosed, and my heart just hurts. And I'm able to come alongside. I, I, I don't say, well, you know, people die. That's not me. God has supernaturally given me this gift. It's a unique blend. But he's done that with every one of you. Every single person here in this room has gifts. I'm looking back. I'm, I'm going to get personal. These are my friends here, and they don't know I'm going to talk about them. But So, you know, if I got a broken knee afterwards, it's one of them. But I'm just going to do that right now, right? I, I look back over here, and I got my brother Lou Pelfini right back over here. Th this guy ha has a heart for the truth. He's got the gift of a exhortation. He speaks boldly. And as he uses that gift, it blesses my heart like nobody else. I look right down here, Ross Thornton. One of our young adults. Ross is wishing he was some other place right now. <laughs> Ross has a heart for evangelism. Loves to see people brought into the faith. And if you hang out with Ross, he'll talk about sharing the, boldly. Listen, we're better. See, when we start realizing everybody's got different gifts and there's a unique blend for every single person in our church family. In the first service, I called out a dozen group of people. And just and many times, if you don't know your, your spiritual gift, there's a couple things I'm going to tell you. For, first off, um, if you go to our website and across there's a banner across the top, click on the one that says more and you'll say resources. Click on that. And there will be an online um, assessment you can do, telling, filling in, really, it takes you about five minutes, seriously. And it will tell you, you'll rate some different things, and it will tell you what your spiritual gifts are. Is it flawless? No. Is, is it the Word of God? No. It's been a helpful tool. We've set it up, and over the last few years, we have 9,200 different people. Other churches are using it as well to help them identify what their spiritual gifts are. If you are a non-techie person, Jesus loves you too. We have these, and as you leave out on the, in the Welcome Center today, just pick one of these up. Don't pick that up. Just pick this one up as you leave. And it will talk about what the spiritual gifts are, and it'll help you go through. You can do, do it all yourself. But listen, God's gifted you, and he wants to use you in his kingdom for his good. Every single person in this room and in our church family supernaturally given, and only when we all... All use our gifts are we healthy as a body, able to run the race. And you say, Rich, why is this such a big deal? I'm wrapping it up. Trust me, I am. Why is this such a big deal? Let's look at our last point, third point. God gave spiritual gifts to people in the church to carry out the spiritual functions of the church under the spiritual leadership of people given to the church. We talked about that. So that his mission may be accomplished through the church. Ephesians 4.12 says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. For a long time, I thought this was my job. I said, oh, he's talking to pastors. He says, Rich, it's your job to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And in truth, that is part of my job. But listen to me, it's your job too. Every single one of them to equip the saints for the work of ministry. What's the work? There's only one work. Discipleship. Sharing the gospel and helping them grow. Every single one of us are responsible for equipping the saints. It's not only my responsibility. I get to share that with you. How, well, Rich, how long does this go on? Well, let's look at verse 13. Until... Until we all attain to the unity of the faith 
and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What is he talking about ultimately? He's talking about heaven. We stay in this till we're with Jesus in heaven. So this is the big picture is heaven. But listen, it's the daily pursuit. Your life, you're involved as a Christian in something more important than vacations, more important than your marriage, more important than your kids, more important than your finance. This is what you've been called for. And he's using a bunch of misfits like you and me to be faithful. You pray with me. God, you created your body, the church, in such a way that it takes all of us. It's not just about a few people on the stage. It's about the body of Christ together fulfilling the functions that allow us to accomplish the mission. Lord, in this moment, I pray that you'd speak to us. And I'm going to be quiet for a moment. I want you to just bow your head, and I want you to talk to the Lord. Have you been sitting on the sidelines? Letting somebody else run the race? Or, or maybe you're just at a place that you don't know what, how God has gifted you, and that needs to be the next step, is trying to figure out how God has used you. You, it, you just talk to the Lord. I'm going I'm to be quiet. You just listen, and you speak to the Lord. Lord, when we really think about it, <laughs> when we think about the price you paid, when we think about the transaction that took place from tr transferring us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, changing us from being your enemy to being your sons and daughters, and we just have that laid down before us, we think, why would we not want to use the supernatural gift that you've given to us. Lord, I, I thank you and I praise you for all over this church, people having figured it out and understand where they fit, how you've gifted them and the joy that they have. But there's others of us here today that just need to take that next step of trying to figure it out and then making the phone call or whatever it is to get involved because we can't run the race, not like you want us to. Saved equals gifted. We celebrate that. And each of us, Lord, as we pursue you, we pray that you'd make that more clear to us. And even now, Lord, as we have a time to just have a communion service together, to eat together, the Lord's Supper. Lord, this is a special time when believers get to reaffirm our commitment to confess sin and listen to you. It's the first time many of us have been quiet for a long time. And so we want to pray that we would just take advantage of this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching Hessel Online. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on the latest content and share this with a friend. If you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for watching and may God bless you.